Uh, this is the water if you need. Oh, great, thanks. Okay, thanks for joining me in your office here today. Oh yeah, absolutely. We have Anna Chinuntai, the CEO Hello. of Apis Core. I've been wanting to get this interview for a long time. I've been uh, interviewing the CEOs of all the different 3D printed construction companies and Apis Core is such a well-known company. Um, this was very important to me that I had this conversation. So yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time to Absolutely, me. thank you for having me. And uh, I know that you also travel, travel a lot. So yeah, we finally like a yeah. <laughs> made it. <laughs> you had that event uh, yesterday. You gave the presentation about Frank, your printer. Yeah. Uh, that was a great presentation. I guess that group, the 3D printing group, they do regular meetups. So most of the audience comes there a lot, or yes. And as I know, they basically like do the standard plastic 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And Groundsville, they be like, oh, we actually have something more excited, <laughs> uh, concrete 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's more. It, it was basically like a general uh, public, as I understood. Yeah. I was actually at this building just like a month ago or so. Oh yeah. <laughs> I noticed on the other side of the fence in the sand. Um, there was some maybe pumping equipment or a silo. Uh, I guess the company ECC, uh, maybe that was their equipment they left there. Did you have a good experience with that equipment or have you switched it up since then? Uh, pumping equipment? You mean the Amtec? I didn't see it up close because it was behind the fence and it was a barbed wire. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it was Amtec. It also looked like there was some kind of trailer. Uh, maybe an insulated trailer and oh yeah it was the early uh stuff that we like developed before mm -hmm. because you know like uh, we came we did a very like a long journey like uh, what the solution might be the, the best one mm -hmm. we tried a lot of different stuff and so where we are today it's basically the result the extension like a very extensive experience and trying a lot of stuff so the big trailer that you probably saw, it's like what the earlier stuff that we tried, like mm -hmm. uh, how the equipment should, should look like. And of course, it's like a giant tra trailer. I believe it was public, like a, we, we released it maybe uh, three, four years ago, mm -hmm. but it's like a I'll really like a early a research development. Then we're like, no, it's not gonna work. <laughs> we need to do this, something better. And this is how we actually came up with Gary. But no, actually we came up to, uh, to create Gary after we also working with the standard like uh, plastering machines. Mm -hmm. You know, today 3D printing company, they use the standard plastering machines. And it was complete disaster. So we, we managed to 3D print this building with that uh, equipment, yeah. but then like, no, we're done with this. <laughs> we need to create something that like uh, really um, tailored for the 3D printing process. Yeah. Because plastering machines, they like, a, you know, you just apply plaster, it's like, a, it's not vis high viscosity material, it's not the facet in time material, it's 3D printing material. So it was a lot of problems that we just clog in, you know, clog in the mixing, it was like not consistency with the printing, so we learned a lot during this uh, project. And then we're like, yeah, we know what the equipment has to be created for the 3D printing process, mm -hmm. and today it's Gary. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense because it almost mirrors your printer. You didn't just take uh, the technology that exists like a robotic arm and uh, make it print concrete. You made Frank a custom machine yes. specifically for that purpose. So like the like that same mentality with the mixer, uh, it makes sense that you would need something special for that application, not just the standard plaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And what about the, I guess you don't need a silo anymore because you'll be trucking in the, the material? Yeah, so uh, we have Mary. <laughs> so it's Frank, Gary and Mary. Family that like... Uh, uh, family that through the print the houses. Sure. So Mary, it's like a... For people who don't, don't know who, who, who the, the Mary. <laughs> so Mary is the bulk truck. Mm -hmm. uh, that basically transport the material to the construction site. And then you just plug in Gary to Mary and dry material comes from Mary to Gary, mixed with water, and then immediately comes to, to Frank. So basically okay. the material get, uh, mixed with water just right before it got extruded. And so the, we, we also did this because 3D printed material, it's not like the regular concrete, right? It's kind of sensitive material, as long as, of course, you want to have a very good result. Mm -hmm. So the material has to be very well sealed 
Yeah. And during the transportation or during the production. So it's really like a, another very big piece of the technology. And this is actually very important, important to have the very nice 3D printed house mm -hmm. or like the wall, the final product. And so Mary like carries the material and once the material in Mary is like a fully sealed and then it's not exposed to any environmental conditions like the humidity uh, or rain or anything. So this is how we actually can like uh, ensure that the 3D printed walls will be like a repeatable and with the quality that we, we know it's going to be. Yeah. I wonder how substantial the impact is too of the saving the bags. You don't need to use the oh, yeah. plastic and uh, paper bags. Uh, yeah, exactly. And also the all of the labor that also needed like to carry mm -hmm. the, the, the bags. So uh, that also the entire idea behind this. Like uh, the process should be like uh, you show up on the construction site, print house, that's it. Without like uh, uh, extra work just to serve the new fancy technology as many <laughs> people mm -hmm. think. So yeah, you need to provide not only the robot that extrude the sausages, but all of the surrounding solutions. So it's like a, together, this is the technology, like a full, fully solution, like a, without creating more problems, mm -hmm. you know. You posted a bunch of teaser pictures online recently of a building you guys are working on in America, it seems like. Um, the location hasn't been disclosed yet, <laughs> um, but there were some pictures of it in the presentation you gave yesterday. I guess one thing that needs to be addressed as 3D printing grows is how do you get contractors who have never worked with this technology before as you're spending to new regions to um, apply their trades, whether it be electrical, roofing, plumbing, uh, to 3D printing without uh, too much of a learning curve. How do you address the learning, the required learning curve for your subcontractors on the job site? So basically what we're doing right now, we're working with the very limited uh, amount of partners that we also like together testing everything and like helping them to mm -hmm. learn this too. Uh, but you're absolutely right that like a 3D printing technology is so new and contractors and construction companies, they like immediately have questions like, oh, how I do the electrical, how I do uh, plumbing, all of those things. Uh, so the general answer is like, a, uh, you need to do this the same way as for the concrete masonry unit wall because we basically, m our 3D printed walls completely the same as CMU mm -hmm. walls. So this is the first step that we have been, that we created just to help industry to understand this. And as long as you're saying this, they're like, oh, okay, this is the CMU wall. Yeah, now I know how to do the bond beam, how to do the roofing and everything. But right now we're also working on how to uh, even uh, improve the, uh, we call it secondary construction, mechanical, like mm -hmm. plumbing, roofing, bonding, uh, bond beam. How even like to improve this process, right? Because the technology allows to implement a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things for value engineering mm -hmm. for the insulation you can basically install the electrical mechanical plumbing as you print mm -hmm. and so this is something that we're working on right now so because we we really our goal as a company is not just to print the walls and saying like oh it's faster but how we really can do the overall construction really faster so our goal right now is that to 3D print, to build the finished house within five days. So it's like everything, wow. walls, uh, mechanical electrical plumbing, roofing, so you basically are ready to move in. We know how to do this, we're working on this, and it's just because the 3D printing technology, specifically our proprietary technology, allows to really like incorporate a lot of innovations to shorten the cons construction time overall. So this is our goal right now. Yeah, there's a... I'm sure you know, uh, or maybe you're blind to them, but there's all kinds of competitors popping up all the time, new companies that are developing this technology, um, a lot of them at much earlier stages than Apis Core. Uh, it seems like the first step, get a printer, make concrete come out the end of it, and then make Be excited. <laughs> try to make two layers, and then three layers, and then uh, maybe they try to make a house, but when they make that first house, they're just trying to make sure the layers are staying on top of each other, they're not thinking about the insulation yet, the electrical plumbing, it's probably not even permitted. Uh, and so now you're at the stage where you have the machine, it pumps, 
and you have to figure out how do we make this applicable and viable on a construction site. Exactly. I would say like we already know how to like make it applicable, right? Now we are in the stage how to really do it better and really <clears throat> how we can change the entire construction process. Not just how the walls are printed. Uh, it's again, it's like a, already a huge step forward mm -hmm. to do the walls, but okay, how we really can disrupt the industry and like a, how we can do everything better and faster. So yeah, we right now in this process when we incorporate all of the value engineering and the building, te uh, building uh, technologies of the building performance, construction technolo technologies, everything. So just for fun, let's fast forward to like a highly viable stage of the industry where now your team is pumping out houses um, and you need to scale. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest challenges that are going to come with the scaling as construction is historically a very fragmented industry with uh, a lot of family owned businesses there's not a lot of there's not like an apple of construction uh, mm -hmm. today so how do you how do you scale the technology in an industry that's historically been uh, anti scaling yeah and it's uh, also the challenge for the construction technology is kind of like a conservative but it also the uh, question for how to scale up the hard tech hard mm -hmm. technology because we have robots it's software material science it's uh, actual like a mix in it's it's really like a, a lot of stuff you know the first question like a, how to produce them uh, a lot like a hundred manufacturing hell yeah manufacturing hell exactly so like uh, doing the first prototype it's easy uh, but sometimes people do this thing that it's not the prototype is hard but no the prototype, it's easy, but how you really can go to the hundred of the of units within the first uh, short period of time. So this is the first question. And so then it's really like a how to get people understand how it works and really use it successfully. Mm -hmm. So this is why we also do the Episcore University, for example, because we, we know that education is a big part of how to really push the technology and adopt this. Because even when we talk with the building officials, and we just noted that we really educate them, and first time they sometimes like, oh no, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't think it's safe and sound, something like this. But then when you just really educate them and say like, you know, we do the reinforcement the same way as like yeah. in this building goes for masonry, this, this, and this. And they become more like uh, relaxed, you know, comfortable, and, uh, this is very important to educate the industry and people who want to be involved in this. So I would say the education is another very important piece of the how to scale the technology. And uh, yeah, and then it just uh, do more and more successful projects so people see how it works, train them. And uh, I would say this is like the two main puzzles to scale up the technology. Do you think in the future it's realistic to expect um, that 3D printing will uh, the main thing? <laughs> no. Uh, how do I phrase this? Um, <clears throat> I don't know why I'm drawing a blank here, but. Fine. <laughs> We can cut it later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. But I was really curious about it. Maybe I'll think about it. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you have the Apis Core University. Are you, you were saying education is such an important part of getting people interested in 3D printing. You can't implement the technology if there aren't people that know how to use it. So are you working with other universities besides you, the only one you're creating to try to teach uh, students? Not now, but we have this plan too because you know, the young generation, it's basically the the ones who are going to be using this, right, also. Mm -hmm. So we need to start preparing them too. And uh, uh, also the uh, interesting thing, not interesting thing, just the fact that the younger generation today, they're like, oh, I don't want to work in the construction site. It's so hard dirty work, so why do I need to do this? So young young generations, they go to the software or something like that, much easier. But with the 3D printing technology, with robotics 3D printing technology, and I would really would like to stress out with specifically using our solution, 
which is portable, mobile, easy to use. Basically, I can easily use the printer. So in the projects that we are doing right now, I sometimes like uh, help him do something, and I know that like uh, okay, if I just have the uh, training, I can really manage the thing just by myself. And I also can drive the Dodge Ram, for example, and come to the construction site. We have the tablet that you just you know operate the printer. It printer just wheels to the concrete slab. So I basically don't need to do anything, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I don't need to find 10 strong people, like just assemble or disassemble a huge machine because our machine is not huge. And so with this solution with that, that we have, it's really become very, very available for people who like uh, lost the opportunity to be involved in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. So let's say the uh, retired people. So. They, they of course want to be still like, still want to work in the construction, but for example, just because they are healthy issues or something like this, they cannot really like do the heavy physical sure. work. MGs. They, yes, they just have to. Okay, I, I cannot do anything. But if you have our technology, for example, they can just oh, I can keep working and it's not so hard. And uh, the same for women, for example. I just personally want to have more women in the industry, women like me, for example, who could just start the construction pro uh, project uh, in construction business, mm -hmm. which used to be considered as the male dominated, right? Just because it was really like a hard thing to do, but today we really, it's something that changed. And with the younger generations, they also like, oh, now being the construction worker, it's not so ah, <laughs> like this, yeah. right? So I can be the printer operator, that's so cool. And so this is uh, why they uh, like uh, collaborating with the universities, it's, the next step that we consider. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy with so many young people wanting to work with a computer, software, hardware, even uh, like mechanical engineers versus on a construction site. If you don't have the people to do the physical labor, you need some kind of uh, technology solution. And if that's what people are going to learn and that's what they want to do, uh, why not make it possible for them to yeah. complete the job the way they do? Yeah, right. absolutely. You still need the like a labor to complete the house, mm -hmm. for now. but for example, uh, to build the walls uh, with the masonry bl mm -hmm. blocks, it's really like a heavy work, right? So that now you can just complete at least this hard work, and then hire less people to complete the other structural elements. Being a startup. I'm sure you've had many moments where you had to pivot your business model and change uh, over the years. Um, what's been kind of the biggest moments in Apis course history where you were going one direction, you realized, oh, we really should change. <laughs> Did you see that big trailer in Dubai? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was one of the change. It's like, a, we, we, we spent a lot of time basically creating this, but mm -hmm. then we're like, oh my God, no. We just need to forget about this. But it was a lot of like uh, money and efforts to develop this mm -hmm. thing. But we also can kind of learned, right? And we also like, uh, yeah, okay, we just need to bear this. <laughs> I would say because you all the time have the um, really you have to move forward, and sometimes you really just stop doing some something that you thought it's like oh the next big thing. Cut your losses. <laughs> what? You cut your losses. Yes, yes, exactly. And so basically. A lot of changes in the actual technology and equipment. That was a lot of, I would say, really uh, a lot of hard decisions, but right decisions that we did. And this is how basically we evolved and have the the solution today. Um, also with the market uh, and your strategy, like uh, how you really go into enter the market, mm -hmm. because I think. Many companies even today like uh, trying to figure this out because the technology is so new, it's a huge interest, but you need to find the right approach, right, and find the right, like what's what's your customer, what the value proposition. And that was a lot of learning curve of this too. So even today we, we're going to do something very interesting soon. So. We hope that you can visit us in December. I'll be happy to. <laughs> yeah, so I would say the startup all the time is hard. You have to do pivots all the time. But when you do the technology that never existed before. Sorry. You can answer. Um, yeah, so.
Uh, basically, doing startup, it's a challenge. Okay. Yeah. Any time so. Okay, no, I need this. Okay, one more time. So doing this, the, 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 the startup, mm -hmm. it's a big challenge, right? You all the time need to do pivot uh, to find the right angle, how to enter the market, how to uh, develop your technology, what the features have, have to be involved, right? But it's become more hard, even harder when you do the technology that never existed before, yeah. right? So nobody did 3D print houses before, so you don't have references, like what, could be successful, yeah. what practices can I use, because there are no practices. And when you talk to some experts, let's say, it's really hard to know, uh, like to identify what's right, what's not, because if you talk to experts in the construction, with the traditional construction, yeah. of course they do, they provide you all of the advices, like a very standard, not innovative, right? Because it's like uh, the same as, for example, you do the startup with the uh, neural link or something like this sure. for, for your brain, for example, and you come to people to have advice, to doctors who had the lobotomy, right? So what advices you can get from them, right? And so this is also some like the hard thing because you need to figure out, you need to have the vision, like okay, nobody really know how to do this because it's never existed before so we need to figure out and so this is the another challenge sometimes you can be wrong sometimes you really can be right if you do the research and believe in your vision of course when you first got started there was so little going on in the 3d printed construction world so it's probably builds your confidence a little bit to see around the world so many people getting involved right uh, what do you mean seeing uh, how interested the whole world is becoming like the, the interest in 3D printing has been growing and the number, the amount of investment coming in and uh, people interested has been uh, since then expanding, right? And has that, I, w I would think that kind of increases your confidence in uh, the industry going forward. Um, I would think what's really increased the confidence, it's just the really hard work and see that it's the right thing to do after some, like you see the results. Okay. Because it's, it, it's very easily to get confused because again, uh, technology is new, industry new, and all of the people have a lot of different opinions, mm -hmm. right? So really have the strength to follow your vision and believe in what you do, yeah. and then see that oh yeah, I was right, that really worked. That's something that uh, help you to build the confidence, um, and the. Uh, it's also nice to see that more and more companies doing the uh, the this technology, but in terms of confidence, uh, I think it's really just the uh, seeing the result of your work, and it's something that really worked, and it worked the same you believed it should work. <laughs> and getting better. <laughs> yes, exactly, and see the progress. So, a while ago, a few years ago, you were maybe something I saw about selling printers, maybe collecting pre-orders or something, and now your model, you pivoted since then to a rental model. I was thinking maybe that was because I've noticed a lot of the people that have bought printers, it's not like they buy it and then that's the end. Have a nice day, enjoy your printer. It's a huge uh, relationship still just to teach them how to operate it and to manage the, the training process and the learning curve in the beginning where they're figuring out how to get the mixer working and how to time everything properly, um, is that part of the reason you chose to do a rental thing, so that it's more of like a partnership relationship? Uh, yes, it's one of the thing, um, and also we have to be very close to the users, mm -hmm. you're right, like to make sure that they really use it correctly, because it's very easy to say, oh, technology is awful. Not because it's awful, <laughs> just because you, for example, didn't use it correctly. So it's really like the long-term commitment to make sure that everything works yeah. and we can provide all the time all of the technical support and also the technology we uh, improve and really yeah we improve the technology like uh, almost every day right so for us it's important to uh, like uh, update the equipment that makes a lot of sense right so instead of like oh you know this machine is like a it's old version you need to buy a new one it's really worked for Apple, <laughs> that's fine, but 
it's not something that we want to do, right? Different price point. Yeah, and for example, we want to uh, to uh, we create the new extruder, right? And like, oh guys, you can right now ex install the new extruder, new features. And maybe in the future we we will switch to another business model. But now it's something that we really believe it it will help the users to successfully start using the technology, learning this, and be really happy uh, when using the product. Yeah, when you put it that way, it makes it sound. Uh I didn't even consider the fact that printers could become obsolete and if they buy them then that's really completely on the customer. They r could feel cheated by the company or they're mm -hmm. really bothered by the yeah. fact that they don't have the latest uh, latest thing. So that's two solid advantages to the uh, to the rental model. I think companies I think, are afraid of the rental model because they don't want the responsibility of having to mm -hmm. handle the customer, <laughs> take the printer back after they banged it up or... Uh, I don't know, but a lot of people want to rent a printer. Yeah, because it also provides the flexibility for, for the user. Via the technology, again, it's new. And a lot of people, they're really excited, they really want to be in this uh, space, like uh, be part of the big change, right? But they're like, oh, I don't know how to use it. Or like, uh, It's all the time like a uh, risk that playing in your head. Like, mm -hmm. uh, what if I don't like it? What if I, I wouldn't be able to use it successfully? You know? like. Uh, they need to have this flexibility, something like, okay, I use this printer, let's say, five months, and now I just need more time, for example, to change something in my uh, in my construction company, in my processes, and then I would like to rent it again. So it's also for the flexibility, to provide this flexibility, considering that it's a, the new technology, new industry, and we want people to be successful in using this. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is really just to help to push for the technology. Are you doing Black Friday deals? <laughs> uh, not this year, mm -hmm. but I think, yeah, we can do this. Maybe in the future. <laughs> Even like uh, like home security systems have like Black Friday deals these days. Oh yeah, it's, uh, I never bought anything on the Black, uh, Black Friday. Maybe I should start really? doing this. <laughs> no. I always do. I buy equipment. like. Yeah. Hard drives usually. I just so busy and like uh, I I I saw something. Oh, probably I need to buy this. But then like uh, oh, do I really need this? So <laughs> yeah, I'm probably not this type of person. But I don't think they really do Black Friday deals in the construction equipment world anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's mo mostly for consumers, I think. But we're gonna do the Black Friday for like uh, online courses and workshops. Yeah. Okay. For more like a uh, you know e easy product. Yeah, that like makes it. sense. Yeah. The um, we were just talking about the which projects? Uh, I forgot what I was going to say again. I don't know. Miss Missouri or what project? No. Crap. I, can't, I don't know why. <laughs> I guess the late meetings. And it's Friday. Your, yeah, your brain, like, ooh. <laughs> After this, I'm going to go drive up to Georgia and then. Yeah. Uh, going to Virginia on Sunday. Driving actually is a really hard thing because like uh, when I driving a lot I was like uh, my brain is completely blind so I just prefer not to drive a lot so yeah probably that's the reason. I actually really like driving. I It's like meditative because uh -huh. like you're saying like nothing's going on so once you get through all your playlists and there's no music left it's just like yourself and your thoughts on the road. <laughs> yeah, and you can also use some of the uh, audiobooks. Mm -hmm. But I really prefer flying. I really like the uh, long flights. Really? Oh. Um, it's, re it's really like not, not very comfortable, but I noticed that I can do a lot of things during the uh, like mm -hmm. five hour flight because you cannot go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And even like the Wi-Fi sometimes so terrible. True. So, I just noted that it might be a good thing for the productivity. Of course, it's not easy to do it constantly, but it can really help if you really need to do something. Read a book, for example. Yeah. <laughs> I read a lot of books just on the one, you know, take just during the flight. But the driving it's hard because you just need to be concentrated. So I hope that uh, um, autonomous cars will be available soon. Yeah. So I will be very fun, very big fan of this. We're opposite in that way. I would much I would rather drive twenty hours than fly fifteen. <laughs> but Yeah. Um oh we were talking about the three D printing rental model. I wanted to say the it's very rare that 
construction companies buy their own equipment over a hundred thousand dollars they almost are always renting it so it's in line with the traditional system that's in place for mm -hmm. these companies sometimes people kind of say i want a 3d printed house and say well the only solution really right now in your area since there's no printers you have to buy a printer if you want a 3d printed house you need to basically invest like a quarter million dollars half a million dollars however much with the various companies uh so having the rental option makes it something they're used to yeah and uh in construction, it's a lot of uh, a lot of different business models. It also depends on the how big the the equipment. So Caterpillar, for for example, they only sell their bulldozers, mm -hmm. for example. But there are other types of construction equipment that they actually you only can rent, and with the dedicated personnel mm -hmm. operating this machine, because companies also make sure that it's going to be used correctly for safety yeah for safety rather than just random piece uh, person without the training and everything just break the the equipment so it's really the, the a lot of different uh business models and uh, and i uh, as i was saying one of the challenges is not only just to create the technology that works but also find the product market fit you know like uh, how it really can work in the way that it can be scaled up, mm -hmm. right? And business model is, is part of this. Yeah, I am not yet aware of any companies that have bought a printer and been able to turn an ROI from it. And uh, I don't know of any individuals that have made more money than their printer costs so far. Mm, yeah, um, the, the space is very limited today. And I think some companies like leverage this situation because today people really want to uh, to extrude the concrete and see it and be excited about this and then they figure out oh just to have the uh, big printer and extrude sausages it's not the uh, the only thing that they need so I think it's just learning cur curve for everybody yeah yeah so in future I, I assume that uh, at least it's our goal to uh, provide the product that really people can love and achieve the business goals and make money with this, right? It's like how to do the product that can uh, that users can really like and successfully use. Yeah, once it hits that, uh, you reach the value engineering and the learning curve and you hit that make money part, mm -hmm. like 3D printed construction is a niche. Making money is not a niche. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Everybody <laughs> loves making money, so it, it'll be... Uh, explosive for the industry I think when people see oh somebody bought this printer and then they made a million dollars because yeah. they printed this many houses and exactly and this is the goal of the technology so basically um, as I was saying yesterday so the 3d printing technology is a tool how to increase productivity for the construction companies mm -hmm. right so they can build more and also like uh, make more money right and uh, also uh, provide more houses for the end and end users like right for people who are going to live in the houses so the goal of any business is like to make money right so uh, for the construction company it's like a how to increase productivity and make more money right so the the the, the reason of this technology why the 3d really printing technology exists it's like how we can not just build houses uh, in in bigger amount but how also the construction companies who are actually going to be the uh, the ones who push the technolo technology forward mm -hmm. uh, how they can be successful in this if we don't find how to make this possible how to provide this construction company the users the tool how to successfully working with this the technology like uh, will not have any sense to exist you know <laughs> more of an art than a construction if it ends up being like that but I think it's uh, since it's improving, we still see um, improvements constantly. There's no reason to expect uh, those improvements to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and technology right now is really like it's uh, really evolving right now. And uh, actually, if we, uh, that's really good thing that people just buy uh, the printers and like uh, maybe don't really make money yet, but experiment. experiment and this is the. They do a huge contribution to this, so I really love seeing that people do this house, that house. Maybe it doesn't look great now, but at least it's like a, um, increase awareness and more people like a certain interested in this. Uh, even like a, with the 
uh, investment area, for example, now more and more investors are really interested in this. Because when you t just talk, like, a, I don't know, three, four years ago, even like a mm, construction company, they were like, what? Oh, it's not going to happen. You know, it's like it's science fiction. So, but all of these projects, even they are prototypes, they really change the way how the technology is perceived by, by everybody. You know. For the project you did in America, was the insurance just the general contractor's standard umbrella insurance, or was there some kind of special uh, arrangements you needed to make? So this is very very good question actually because the uh, insurance for the company that three different houses it's almost impossible to receive because they're like oh we don't work with the three different houses and like, like no a, data. yeah we we don't know what codes we don't know how to quote you and what we also uh, our partner in Missouri what they did a very great job so they found the uh, company insurance company who like oh we really like what you do. So we will help you to kind of find the solution. Mm -hmm. So what the what was done is that they really like uh, explain and describe how it works. They explain all of the safety f uh, factors, and it was like the custom deal. You know, they like basically assigned them the custom type of insurance, but it's also was kind of a challenge. So the insurance for the construction companies who are going to do the tribute houses, it also maybe somebody should start doing this business it's a good idea actually <laughs> because the uh, insurance companies that like yeah we really need to look at this because more and more people are asking about this and we, we don't have anything to provide if the houses are still standing in 20 years it's a good business but if something happens <laughs> uh, they basically insurance it's for the uh, not for the houses but for the company that operate this type of equipment mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. for houses it's it's a little bit easier because basically you can provide all of the data that this is the concrete like material uh the compressive strength so for houses it's been a little bit more easier you know like a better because the wood stick house for example costs much more in the insurance because of the fire uh factor okay. all of this stuff so yeah i i, I was mainly saying about the for the construction business, insurance construction insurance for the business insurance yeah so the home insurance should be cheaper because concrete is not flammable hopefully yes yes so basically and uh, even for CMU for the CMU built house as I know it's also insurance is like more affordable mm -hmm. of course it's a lot of factors like the your location state everything but for the home insurance it's it's supposed to be better for the houses because of all of the value of engineering that you also can add and say like, oh, actually insulation in our, our houses, it's not exposed to this in these areas. So we kind of have, uh, have done it in a more safe way. Your printer is also well suited um, potentially for earthquake zones because it's not a large gantry system. So you're not doing monolithic structures, right? Um, I would say that the Gantry printers, like uh, my opinion, it's really hard to <laughs> to use and deploy, and, like to scale this. Mm -hmm. But y yeah, you're right. Basically, you know, very interesting question because um, yeah. So basically, for the uh, Gantry printers, you have to have a very precise concrete uh, slab because you know, like uh, this type of. Uh, machines they can be really like a mm, how to say when they you know doesn't work and doesn't move just you because misaligned. of this, yeah misaligned so because because of the slab, s slab uh, is not really a flat for example it came actually from the regular CNC machines so basically gantry printers they came from the idea that the CNC machine that existed hundreds of years ago mm -hmm. like how we can do them much bigger of course if you do it bigger, it's uh, much more challenges for design and how to really make them work perfectly. So yes, you need to have the concrete slab. And uh, uh, the, if you build with the... Uh, but actually, no. I, that's a really interesting question. I just really uh, think it out, out loud. Sure. Because Take your time. even if, you, if it's earthquake um, area, you still need to build the concrete slab 
to comply with the building codes because you build the concrete slab not just for the printer, mm -hmm. right? It's for the house too. So anyway, even if you're in a high uh, earthquake in the area, you still have to build the concrete slab as it's required here. So I don't think that the earthquake um, uh, requirements is something like make the gantry printers sure. worse, I would say, in using. Uh, no, I, I don't think that the earthquake, and at least as, as I'm thinking now, <laughs> I don't think that this is the key, key uh, thing that can decide like oh, our printer or get printer. From an insurance perspective, it'll be interesting over time, uh, they'll collect data. So if you have more 3D printed houses, you'll see if there's a big fire, maybe the only houses left in the neighborhood are the 3D printed houses, or if there's an earthquake, and then maybe the insurance is cheaper for mm -hmm. them, even like cheaper than it might be already. I don't because the material is so strong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how far off are we from the printed concrete being recognized for its structural integrity? Um, Obviously, I, there's I, no like clear answer. Yeah, and I, I don't think that the question is kind of like a right. <laughs> but basically, um, you don't need to have the actual concrete, like through the printed concrete be recognized. Okay. Uh, you have to have data that this material have this uh, compressive strength, this durability, this three point flexural thing, everything basically required for the concrete. And then you need to prove that the structures built out of this material are structurally safe and sound. So this is how we, this is why we designed the mm -hmm. concrete masonry unit like through the green wall. Because we say that the material of this compressive strength, but the structure with this material also reinforced, uh, the same with as the masonry. So this is how we get the structural uh, integrity for the 3D printed structure, right? Because even if you have the very good and strong material, but your structure are not safe and sound, it's like, a, hmm. it's not enough, you know? So basically for the, you need to have the engineer stamp to your drawing saying that, Yes, this material is okay and structure is okay. We have data for this, and uh, basically this is how it works. And uh, later maybe it can be more unified building codes, but now you you even can do with this. So to be more specific, what are the chances we can do away with reinforced columns poured in after the fact and just have printed walls with no poured concrete in the walls, just poured for the slab? Ah, so you mean when the technology can be used just to print the slab? No, to print the walls of the house with no reinforced columns. Oh, I, I don't know if it's even possible. Because the you still need to reinforce the walls. Um, basically, it, it, for the building in Dubai, we didn't do CMU style walls. Yeah. We really do the reinforced concrete construction. Mm -hmm. It was the columns. Uh, it was more than 30 columns. I With believe. rebar and then you poured concrete yes, in. Yes, yes. And then it was the basically the uh, self-bearing walls between them. We did not fill them with the concrete mm -hmm. because just uh, columns, structural yeah. columns. So the, we already kind of did it. Uh, but now we find that the CMU-like approach is better, like a, you know, more unified. So it may be impossible to do it without pouring reinforced columns Certainly for a two-floor structure, um. but maybe for one story, you do it without it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a structural engineer, yeah. but I, I kind of know some stuff about this. But I, I don't know. Maybe with the new materials, like the geopolymer, for example. Yeah. The geopolymer material is, uh, first, it's cement-free material, and it's very, very strong. Uh, it can be extremely strong. Maybe if you have this type of material, you don't need to reinforce, but still, Yes, you still need to reinforce because of the how the house, uh, how the building structure works. But so maybe you just reinforce it with rebar. Uh, and not concrete. <laughs> yeah, between the inner and outer layer or something, uh, uh, or a mesh, horizontal mesh. That's the very good question for the very talented civil engineer, <laughs> who has a very good uh, simulation program. Because you know you you have to check everything. Maybe yeah. it's possible. That's one thing I'm hopeful for just to decrease the amount of construction activities that aren't automated. Mm. Yeah, so maybe in the future it might be done, but I think today what really, the direction that can be really solidly uh, 
explored is how to do the electrical mechanical plumbing as this, this type mm -hmm. of work also during the printing like uh, how to shorten that uh, the time for that type of construction bone beam everything and if we have the walls and secondary construction the MEP that's already going to be oh that's already like a very huge advancement and then uh, it's just a question of the materials I think I guess the goal there is to take advantage of the material setting time and avoid too cutting and too much post processing or for the to to get rid of the reinforcement just or? to integrate MEP systems in the three uh, D printing process. Yeah, it's also the question for the materials and also for the like uh, how to optimize all of the movements at the construction mm -hmm. site. So it's pretty complex thing. It's many factors and how you really can. That's a best. common thing I hear when I ask people, what did you learn from your first project to your second project? They say, mixer pump management, just mm -hmm. like making sure they have everything in the right place and can reach different places. That was uh, an issue a lot of different teams had communicated, just like figuring out logistics of equipment. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you don't have a very good mixing, mixing, uh, mixing pump, if you miss, like you have the... Um, um, uh, just forgot the uh, when basically you layer just to stop and then uh, start, start later so oh, you have the gap mm -hmm. so that's the problem because if th there is a gap then the machine the next layer comes to the specific height mm -hmm. and then the next layer like it's gonna come down and become really clumsy Slump. slumpy yeah so you, you need to fix this gap immediately right and it's of course extra work, extra everything. So you have to make sure uh, that you have the continuous printing process, and you don't need to fix anything uh, on the way. And like a water ratio, so your uh, layers not like a becoming very clumsy, and like you're falling apart. And it's also not become very very like hard because it's also the problems for the machine. So the consistency of the how the material mixed and extruded. I would say this is the one of the biggest key for the successful 3D printing mm -hmm. and using the technology. How often does the system need to be cleaned uh, it, during a print day? Let's say you wanted to run 24 hours. Um, how many cleanings would have to take place during that 24 hours? So basically we need to clean every 8 hours mm -hmm. uh, as of today. Uh, just because the the material is pretty like a high viscosity material and it's not something like a oh equipment stop working. It's something like a, we just need to do this to make sure that the next eight hours will be fine. So your material is proprietary to Apes Core uh, that you developed. The A lot of companies use different strategies to get their material set quickly for the next layer. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have powder accelerants, some of them have an accelerant added at the extruder head. Uh, do you have like a dual mix solution, like a 2K material? No. It's just one? Yeah, it's basically That's the great. already mixed and comes in Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just need to add water. That's it. That's so much more convenient than, uh, because there's already so many parameters you need to balance, like mm -hmm. the water, the temperatures, to have another, the accelerants. Yeah. Uh, and you also need to make sure that all of the accelerants, all of the additives inside, they mix really consistently in the mix mm -hmm. uh, because of course it depends on the mix design but you may have up to eight components in the material some of them really like a tiny one percent for example and you need to make sure that this one percent of the material really consistently distributed. evenly distributed because you may have this amount of material perfectly works and then if you don't have a few accelerants in the needed amount in this uh, portion of the material you need to add more water or you need to add less water so this is where the all of the pain <laughs> comes to the process yeah it's fascinating uh, the material is a huge component after the project's done the printer everything goes away the material's still there yeah uh, getting uh, uh, getting all of the strength and durability and everything that's also the another question like uh, uh, how to do the mix design that not just the material not just extruded successfully but how to also get all of the needed characteristics and parameters in the open environment under the sun under the rain so this is also the another 
challenge for the material science. Have you used tents in the past, or what's uh, if there aren't favorable weather conditions, how do you address that? So it's really like a strong rain <laughs> video work, because basically if we work with the same conditions in the standard construction. That they would pour concrete. Uh, pour concrete or like if the standard uh, construction process cannot be done because very strong mm -hmm. with, uh, rain, we also don't work. So basically, it's the same with the construction Fair. regular. Yeah, and uh, so the sun it's also just so hard, it's so hard, it's so hot for us being there. Uh, in Dubai, for example, we work during the night because it just for us was so hot and the and actually prohibited there to work from uh, 12 to 3 p.m. during the summer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so tent, we, we, we didn't use the tent to, you know, maintain the environmental conditions for the material. Basically use it just for us for, to have some shadow or <laughs> something like this. Yeah. Uh, were there ever sandstorms while you were printing in Dubai? Yes. And so I guess the sand just sticks to the wet concrete? Uh, or you had the tent? So No, we didn't have no any tent. tent. So we just quickly stopped working as I remember. Uh, yeah, and it was sometimes we just started and then the weather just got so, so bad. So we quickly just stopped working because I always was kind of like a danger for us. So it was a lot of interesting environmental conditions that we didn't know <laughs> that it might be in Dubai. If you're working on a wall and you get a portion of the way up, you have to stop. How hard is it for you to start back up from a precise location? So the very great, uh, great uh, question because um, the extruder that we have right now it's so compact, and this is was the idea basically to create this specific compact extruder. Mm -hmm. So we can print really like a next to the previous one because the if you have this big extruder basically like a bucket or <laughs> size of a barrel sure. you cannot come really close to the previously yeah. print uh, wall so this is why we also d designed the extruder this way so it, yeah and in Dubai we already had this uh, extruder maybe it was a little gap and then we basically like uh, improve the extruder mm -hmm. so now we really can print very very closely. When you have two walls very close to each other how do you join them? How, how we join them? So the same so we can put it's basically like the flex uh, flexible gap mm -hmm. so we can put just the our material for example or the standard mortar or like the grout for example and uh, yeah that, that that should be it or any insulating material for example. Mm -hmm. If it's a mortar, then it doesn't serve as an expansion joint, right? But if it's an insulation, then it would serve as an expansion joint. Uh, that's a very good question that I really don't know the right yeah, answer. <laughs> so the Trevor is uh, in our team is the best person to answer this. But uh, yeah, typically we use the grout. In this, uh, actually in this building, we had the gaps something like this and we filled them with the, uh, with the grout, I think, or the regular concrete. So we manage it somehow. <laughs> Moving forward, say for 2022, what are the main uh, focuses for APIS Core that you can discuss? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm so sure there's some you can't discuss. <laughs> yeah, we actually, we're already working on the three very exciting projects as we are speaking right now. It's one of this, it's an industrial project and another project is a housing project. So we, we go into release uh, uh, more news soon. Uh, so I would say that the next year would be very, um, would be the year where we go into do more and more projects, you know, like uh, ac across the country mm -hmm. to demonstrate everything. So we kind of have been preparing for this. Uh, so you will see more construction projects, uh, more online courses, of course. Uh, we also go into do the workshops in February again. So we hosted the workshops in September, and it's going to be again in February. So maybe we're going to do the workshops later in in autumn, like uh, September next year. So it's going to be a very active year of 2022. Awesome. That sounds great. <laughs> it's always nice to see uh, new projects popping up. If people stop printing houses, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very important for you. Yeah, So we will uh, keep you busy. In yeah, I need that year. content. <laughs> Yeah, so I hope that we, we, we will do a lot of great job uh, and 
provide you the content. And your team now, how many uh, employees? I know you have employees in Russia, most of the engineers are in Russia. Uh, no, we actually don't have any engineers oh. in Russia, so we basically fully located here wow. in the United States. And so we have a, a, a lot of remote working, um, it's you not know, the engineers, so they kind of are remotely working. And we have the team here in Melbourne and we are actively growing right now. Oh great. Yeah. So which positions are you hiring for? So we we actually looking for the uh, print uh, operate printer operators That's fun. to help us with the uh, more projects coming soon. Uh, engineers because we we working right now to expand the manufacturing capabilities and something that also going to be the next year. So I would say this is the most uh, needed position that we are looking for. Engineers with equipment manufacturing experience and operators. Yes, yes. Engineers, uh, it's like a fabricating engineers okay. to build, to help us build the, the printers and the, the printer operators, yeah. Maybe you need one of those giga presses like uh, Elon has. Oh, yeah, yeah. And actually, that's uh, very interesting that you brought this because uh, we kind of compare the, the technology to this giga press because basically, uh, let's say the house, single family house, let's say it consists of the 1200 uh, CMU blocks. But using our technology just comes to the one piece, right? And then we also can like do the secondary yeah. construction. So yeah, I really like that you uh, brought this up. Anything involving Elon is great. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a really inspiring company and uh, they did a lot of uh, invention, um, innovations so I think that uh, if you want to to do the innovations in a big way they're really they're a very good example for, for that. If somebody's watching and they want to work at Apis Core uh, for one of those two roles how should they get in touch where should they send their resume? Uh, so basically on our website uh, general contact form uh, sometimes we are not very fast in responding because it's sometimes really it's been a lot of inquiries uh, so far, uh, but they also can reach out our team on LinkedIn. So yeah, I, I'm actually pretty available on LinkedIn as long as something reasonable. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk, yeah. Great, so people can reach out on LinkedIn or your website, that'll be uh, yeah. in the description below. Um, and lots of great projects to look forward to coming up. Maybe I'll try to be back in Florida around February Okay, yeah, we have the workshops, we will be happy to have you. Yeah, I think that would be a great thing to uh, film, give people a little insight of what they could experience if they were to attend a workshop. Yes, yeah, a great idea. It's so important for people to have a chance to work with it before they rent one. Like you were saying, people are nervous, they want to... Uh, and even after they do a course, it's they're not going to have the same level of experience as the Apis Core team who's been operating these printers for years, so I'm sure they'll... Uh, and actually, so the online course, it's something like a, to give you the really fundamental understanding about everything, like uh, what the difference between the 3D printing technology and standard construction. Because even people are so excited, they still like uh, trying to figure this out. So we created the online course to really provide the basic stuff. And then on the workshop, we like uh, dive in more deeply to like uh, how to do the construction documents, how to do the G-code. Uh, what the material how it looks like, but it's still like a, it's not something that you require to have to rent the machine Because even if you rent the machine you still receive the dedicated training for your employees and for your team Like how to actually use the machine. So yeah, the, the education and training is a big big thing So it's not something that we go like it to do. Is it still considered part of your deposit for the machine if you do the, the training training? Uh, you mean the trade? So the deposit for the machine, it's not the deposit, it's actually the reservation. Yeah. Uh, because we are, we are working on right now to increase the manufacturing capabilities. And it's for the first batch, it's going to be like, a, of course, limited amount of the printer that we're going to produce. So now we just accept the reservation saying like, a, you simply reserve the, the <coughs> place and the line, right? Nice. And if, for example, closer to, once we near the production, and we give you all of the terms and the details and if you don't like them for example or something changes in your life you all the time can get the reservation back but it basically just to make sure that 
your spot is reserved in the production line once it's can be uh, once it's going to be ready. Very exciting. <laughs> It'll be uh, fascinating when there's it's just tons of printers out in the world and they're all printing, doing tons of active oh, things. Oh yeah, yeah. I that's going to be really I think the huge thing for the entire. Uh, humanity, I think, because yeah, now we're really working on how to get more printers and how help people to successfully use them. So yeah. I think it'll be really cool for you when you're like on the internet and you see <laughs> some project someone did with an Apis Core printer. You had no idea they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely the future that's like uh, gonna happen, right? And so maybe even like we can see the printers on Moon, you know, some days. Of course, it's like a long shot, but. We strongly believe that the robots it's, are the ones who are going to be first on Moon and Mars. They're already first there, right, to do some research work. So it's also something that we consider that uh, work here on Earth also all the time will help us how we can to find the solution, how we can ex uh, expand to the beyond Earth. What if NASA said, Anna, we need you on Mars. You need to come with the <laughs> printer and help us print it. Um, I don't think that it's going to be the first coming there. <laughs> uh, n n no, I think that it uh, will be more important for me maybe staying here to you make sure. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you can go. Where <laughs> you go? Uh, I believe so. Maybe wow. not in the first one, but later on, once you know the process is like a setup and we test everything. Uh, yeah, I, I would also probably go there too. So. Nikita is still involved in Apis Core heavily, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this is why you don't see him very often because he really works like at 20 hours per day uh, with the, all of the manufacturing and all of this stuff. Yeah, he's, of course. That's terrific. <laughs> and he's in uh, Melbourne too? Yes. Yeah, so we live together, we're married, so we live here in Melbourne, so work together, yeah. And all the engineers are now in America. Yes. So no, uh, you still have some activities in Russia, or you completely moved out of Russia? Uh, yeah, we completely moved out. So we don't have offices in Russia or in Dubai because people also think that we are in Dubai. Mm -hmm. But no, we we finally found our home here in Space Coast. I'm really excited to be in here, and we really love uh, being here in Florida as a state. Yeah, it's a cool location. Florida's a great place uh, to be in real estate and construction oh, right yeah. now. And now it's so, like, a grow, it, it grows so fast. And I think the one thing that's really uh, thanks to the uh, to the governor of the of Florida, because they've been, they, they managed how to keep working during the COVID and help businesses and, and startups and everything, like, to keep moving. So, yeah, I think that the Florida right now the the best state where you not only to live, but also work and do business. I was listening to a real estate podcast where they were talking about how the housing prices are getting crazy, specifically in Florida, uh, and how now it's becoming cheaper to build a brand new house in some cases than to move into a, a used or an old uh, home. Yeah, really. But, yeah, probably it's cheaper, but you need to wait at least six months or even 12. Yeah. So it's yeah. a huge, like, a, you need to wait for almost for everything, even for the construction materials. Windows, you need to buy them, like, a six months in advance. Otherwise, you just probably don't have them. Yeah, a lot of companies have waited until they finished printing to order Windows. Mm -hmm. um, is that the practice you guys engage in, or do you... Uh so for the project that we've done so far, we basically like schedule and everything in advance, of course. It also depends on the project. If it's like the commercial project, you have to have the commercial windows and doors and everything. It's definitely something that's not available in a Home Depot. But if it's like the residential project, you can find it in Home Depot. Mm -hmm. But if, if it's really like a one, two, three windows. But for the construction companies, they built like in a huge amount of houses and, and it, if you need a lot of houses, or even if, for example, they custom built, Home Depot is not gonna help you. <laughs> so yeah, that's the also the challenge for the construction industry today. Have you found any preferred insulation method? I've seen everything from the spray foam to the little beads to just foam blocks. Uh. Uh, yeah, we also use the uh, spray foam, mm -hmm. not not expandable. So because you just don't need to create pressure sure. inside the trigger wall. So yeah, we, we do the spray foam as well. But it's not the only way how you can do this. 
you can do any type of insulation material. Yeah, I've seen uh, aircrete. I just saw recently pretty much every kind of insulation. I, can, I guess it's just a regional uh, preference. For the foam or for the... For the different, like, certain companies have used the same printer with different insulation types mm. different places. But you always use the spray foam, non-expanding spray foam. Yeah. So basically it's something that we have been using so far. Uh, and yeah, it also depends on the vendors that are available in your state. Maybe they experiment in different materials, so yeah. Cool. So you're hiring, people can apply to work at Apis Core right now. Uh, you have big projects coming up in the future. Is there anything we haven't covered that we should talk about? <laughs> Uh, no, I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, me too. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that uh, we can discuss something else. So I think we covered a lot. You know, like uh, driving versus flying. <laughs> yeah, that was the goal. Uh, well, hopefully there'll be more to talk about come February. Yeah. And thanks again for I've been wanting to have this conversation for a really long time, so I'm happy yeah, that it finally too. happened. Like, like, yeah. And. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hope everyone enjoys. Check out Apis Core, the link in the description, and catch you in the next one. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye bye.